let me read to you a passage from the 12th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, verses 14 to 21. It's the Gospel for Saturday after the 15th Sunday in Ordinary Time. St. Matthew writes, The Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. Many followed him, and he healed all their sick, warning them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out, till he leads victory, justice to victory. In his name the nations will put their hope. That's from Matthew chapter 12, verses 14 to 21. It refers to the plot to kill Jesus. The passage I've just read is part of what is evidently a new section in Matthew's account, introduced by, at that time, chapter 12, verse 1. It opens with a reference to the determined opposition of the Pharisees. The nation's life had its status quo, its entrenched religious leaders, and suddenly out of Galilee had come the phenomenon of Jesus of Nazareth. He was singularly powerful in his religious teaching and commanded the admiration and, attend and attention of the multitude. His effortless and numerous miracles were scarcely without precedent. Moses had worked miracles on God's authority, such as the plagues of Egypt and the Exodus, but what could compare with Jesus' ease of miraculous activity? At a word, he raised persons from the dead, calmed the turgid seas, even walked a distance on them, fed multitudes with a handful of food, drove out demons repeatedly, and healed intractable infirmities. As it was said of him on one occasion, never has anything like this been done in Israel. His teaching was of a higher level than that given by the established teachers, and he gave it on his own authority, without recourse to supports. You have heard that it was said to the men of old, you shall not kill. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 to 22. The crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Matthew chapter 7, verse 29. He traversed all Galilee, entering Judea and Jerusalem, and was filling the land with his presence. He was also setting up a structure to assist in his mission, among his many disciples, he appointed twelve. Such an appointment evoked the memory of the twelve patriarchs of old. They were being sent out, preparing the people for his coming and his teaching. So were some seventy or so of his disciples. Luke chapter 10 verse 1. A number reminiscent of the seventy men of the elders of Israel who received some of the spirit of Moses to share in the government of the people. Numbers chapter 11, verse 16 to 17. Was this not to be a new beginning? As far as many of the religious establishment were concerned, this man, unaccredited by the schools and not one bit interested in their accreditation or support, for he claimed to be sent by God, whom he called his own father, was a major upsetting of the apple cart. The greatest cause of perplexity to our Lord's startled opponents was the unexpected and unprecedented personal claims of this Jesus. What intensified the worry of this new business 
was that Jesus also had received the backing of John the Baptist. The confrontation would gradually escalate and involve the highest religious authorities of the nation, the high priest, the temple aristocracy, and the Sanhedrin of Jerusalem. According to the testimony of the Mishnah, and confirmed by a remark of Josephus, the Sanhedrin consisted of 71 members, president included. Despite limits to its authority, de facto, the Jews all over the world acknowledged its authority. It had the exclusive right of judgment in matters of special importance, as for instance, the case of a false prophet. Our Lord was entirely aware of what was facing him and how unyielding the religious opposition would be. He did not try to force the submission of his hostile religious opponents, but was strong and gentle in the face of it. We read that, aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. Many followed him, and he healed all their sick, warning them not to tell who he was. Matthew sees in Christ's reaction the fulfilment of the book of Isaiah's ancient prophecy of the servant of Yahweh who was to come. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 1 to 4. This was to fulfill, Matthew writes, what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out, no one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out, till he leads justice to victory. In his name the nations will put their hope. Matthew chapter 12 verse 14 to 21. The final moment would come, and Christ would freely allow himself to be apprehended by them, and due to traitorous actions by one of his chosen twelve. Historically, and in terms of immediate intention, presumably this was seen by Christ as the opportunity of supreme testimony to the truth before the nation. He would be hauled before the high priest, the temple aristocracy, and the Sanhedrin, several of whom were secretly his disciples, and there he would calmly give his unyielding witness unto death. Mysteriously, this act engineered by Satan and the world of evil, would atone for the sins of the world and bring an unceasing abundance of saving grace to mankind. It was the most extraordinary surprise ever to have come from heaven. Our Gospel passage today places before us, as do many other passages in the Gospels, the opposition between the source of life, that is the light of the world, and the prince of this world, and his children and underlings. Christ was the stronger man who assailed and overcame the one armed and guarding his palace and then took away his spoils. Luke chapter 11 verse 21 to 22. He did it precisely by submitting to death in witness to the truth about himself and his teaching. Our passage today points to a central dynamic in the four Gospels and in the work of redemption. It points to the cross, the resurrection, and the sending of the Holy Spirit. Let us remember our Lord's condition for taking our stand with him. It is that we take up our cross as he did and walk resolutely in his footsteps.